today we will uh, i will just review some uh, briefly review some principles of quantum mechanics to recollect uh, what you must have studied earlier and now before that do you have any questions on the portion that we have covered till now so we have done all classical pictures of uh, nonlinear interactions do you have any questions Okay, so what I'm going to do today is a brief review. It's not a detailed uh, discussion on quantum mechanics, but I'll just recall some of the basic principles and uh, ideas because we would need them uh, through the lectures. Because our objective finally is uh, to quantize electromagnetic fields. Obviously, the question arises, uh, why should I quantize electromagnetic fields? So first thing is that uh, there is a classical theory with, where you assume that uh, everything is classical. Then there's a semi-classical theory where you quantize atoms. You have energy levels of atoms. Uh, you represent uh, the atoms by quantum mechanical principles, but you still consider light as a wave. So most of, for example, uh, applications of light can be treated uh, using semi-classical principles, including lasers. Lasers, uh, you can understand uh, most of lasers by using semi-classical pictures. You don't need a fully quantum mechanical theory to understand the operation of lasers. Of course, you would have to introduce uh, ad, uh, some kind of phenomenological uh, aspects like spontaneous emission. Because if you do a quantum analysis of atomic systems, then you find energy eigenstates. So each energy eigenstate is supposed to be a stationary state, which means if you if the atom is in this stationary state, then the atom will remain in that stationary state forever. Because stationary states are by definition those states for which the probability of finding the particle in that state is independent of time. So if an atom goes to an excited state, why should it jump down to lower energy state and emit spontaneous, spontaneously? This will need an explanation in terms of quantum mechanical principles. So I would need to quantize light to understand the origin of spontaneous emission. But I can actually phenomenologically introduce spontaneous emission and uh, understand uh, most of the properties of lasers. Similarly, uh, photoelectric emission. There is a semi-classical theory which can explain uh, photoelectric emission. I don't need the concept of photons to explain photo photoelectric emission. So there are many other aspects of uh, light interacting with atoms where I can uh, assume light to be an electromagnetic wave and uh, analyze the problem in a semi-classical picture. That means the light is a wave and the atoms or particles are described quantum mechanically. Now there are many applications where the semi-classical theory cannot predict uh, results of experiments. Spontaneous emission is one parametric down conversion, spontaneous parametric down conversion. That means a pump photon splitting spontaneously into two lower frequency photons. The moment I start to use photons, I'm already in the quantum mechanical picture of light. So the fact that when I shine light at a certain frequency into a crystal, I can generate light at lower frequencies coming out of a crystal it's not explainable classically. I would need a quantum mechanical picture to understand why there is spontaneous emission of light in the down conversion process. Parametric amplification, as we discussed in the class, can be explained through those classical equations. The coupled equations of omega s, omega p, and omega i will clearly explain to me why there is amplification, there is phase sensitive amplification, everything comes out there. But if I only input the pump into the crystal, then there is no way to predict that this will down convert to generate lower frequency light. That would need quantum mechanical aspects. There are many other applications and with especially with the advancement in technology, as I was mentioning, you can have sources of light which generate single photons. So to understand some of the properties of this light, which is called non-classical light, I would need a completely quantum mechanical picture. I would need to, uh, I would need to quantize light. I would need to quantize Maxwell's equations and then use those 
quantum mechanical principles to explain my observed phenomena. So before we start to quantize light, what I would like to do is to recall some of the basic postulates and uh, principles in quantum mechanics just to refresh your memory. And uh, much of it we will start to use when we, uh, when we are going through. Some of them maybe uh, I'll recall when we are going through. I may not be able to tell everything right now. But as we go through, we will start to analyze and look at uh, some of these uh, principles and to understand what is the meaning of quantization of light? What is the meaning of quantum theory of light? Now, you all know in classical pictures, you represent, uh, for example, particles by position, momentum, energy, et cetera, et cetera. And these are all classical variables. And these can be precisely measured and defined in classical picture. But as uh, quantum mechanics developed, what was observed is that uh, some of these some of these uh, quantities cannot be measured precisely simultaneously. For example, position and momentum. You cannot measure position and momentum simultaneously precisely. The act of observing, the act of measurement of some quantity of the particle, of the object, seems to disturb the corresponding other quantity. So these are called conjugate variables. Position and momentum are a pair of conjugate variables. There could, of course, be variables which are which can be simultaneously measured, which means I can measure uh, some quantity A and some quantity B in, the given, again, in a given system, both of them simultaneously accurately. So not all pairs of variables are uh, uh, having a situation where they cannot be measured precisely. And so there are, so I would have to introduce this concept somewhere in the mathematical structure of my analysis, and that is what quantum mechanics does. Quantum mechanics is a set of rules, a set of principles, tries to explain what we are uh, observing. And so, for example, you can't measure position and momentum of a particle. And similarly, there are other variables. So in quantum mechanics, what we do is we describe the state of a system or an object by what is called as a wave function or a state vector. Now, you see, there are, uh, what we will do is very briefly discuss uh, the uh, abstract pictures of uh, bracket notation, which was, which was introduced by Dirac. We will not go into the Schrodinger formulation of uh, wave equation, etc., because we would uh, primarily be using the bracket notation in our uh, quantization of light, and that is what I want to recall. So what we will do is we will represent uh, the state of a system by a quantity like this. This is called ket A. Now, this is uh, also called as a state vector. It's not a vector in the coordinate space. It's a vector in uh, some kind of a Hilbert space where it's an abstract space in which I will define. So this vector or this quantity has all the information that is possible for you to know about the system. I would have to relate this to what is the meaning of my measuring position, what is the meaning of my measuring momentum, what is the meaning of my measuring energy, etc. I, I would have to relate this. So this, this state vector, which is similar to the wave function in, uh, in uh, wave, wave mechanics, where we're at the Schrodinger equation in terms of uh, the differential operators and solve, there is this wave function there. Here it is a ket vector. So this vector contains all information as far as the system is concerned. And uh, all observables will be represented by uh, what are called as Hermitian operators. For example, I will use a hat at the, on the top of the uh, quantity to define it's an operator. So you're already familiar with operators. Uh, differential is an operator. Integration is an operator. So there are, you're already familiar with a lot of operators. And so this is the kind of an operator. This operator is Hermitian. I will define what is Hermitian operator. This operator uh, actually operates on this vector, state vector. 
and uh, observables, which means those things that you can observe, will be represented by a special kind of operators called Hermitian operators. So we will, I will uh, come back to this point. Now, for every ket A, I can define another vector in another space called bra A. So for every ket that you can define in a vector space, which is called ket A, I define another corresponding vector in another space called bra A. This is uh, from the, uh, from the, from the word which is called bracket, which Dirac introduced. And I can define, for example, uh, a, 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 a function like this. So I have, for, a, for example, a product, a bracket AB. So this is, this is a, a, a function which is a product of this ket A and bra B. This is a complex number. So, and we define A B is equal to B A star. So star is complex conjugate. So this number is a complex number and A B bracket is actually B A bracket star. And so by this you can see that A A must be equal to A A star. So A A must be a real quantity and we define this to be greater than or equal to zero. And this is called the norm of this get A. It's something like magnitude. Now it so happens that in quantum mechanics, get A and any multiple of ket A, 2 times ket A, 10 times ket A, represents the same state. It's not like a vector in a, in a three-dimensional space where vector f and vector 2 times f are not the same vectors. But in quantum mechanics, the vectors are so defined, the kets are so defined that A or any multiple of A with complex or real or whatever it is, so exponential i phi times ket A, 10 times get A, they all represent the same state. So in, in some kind of a Hilbert space, the direction of this vector, if I can define a direction of this vector, represents the state. Not the magnitude, the direction of this vector. And usually what one chooses is this AA is uh, normalized to, to define this as, so this is called normalization condition. Okay, so now I can operate on a ket to get another ket. A is an operator which operates on a ket A that leads to another ket in the same space, same vector space. Now I define, so for example, with respect to ket A, there is also a bra A, and with respect to bra ket B, there is also a bra B. So what I define is, I define another operator, which operating on bra A gives me bra B. Please note that uh, A A is not equal to B in general. This operator operating on ket A gives me bra B, the same operator operating on ket A, bra A, may not give me bra B. But another operator, a dagger operator, operating on bra A gives me bra B. And this is called the adjoint of this operator. A dagger is adjoint of the operator A. And operator satisfying this condition, A dagger is equal to A are called Hermitian. P 
please interrupt me if you have any question in between. Uh, and uh, actually, you can uh, work out the algebra and show that a dagger, the dagger of a dagger is actually a. And if you have two operators, the Hermitian conjugate of this is b dagger, a dagger. From these definitions, you can actually work out these kind of relationship between the operators. These operators and kets have very, very close similarity to matrices. This ket vector is like a column vector. And these operators are like square matrices. So if you, if you multiply a column vector by a square matrix, you will get another column vector. That's what this equation is essentially. So, Please note that because these are operators, they do not in general commute, which means A times B, in general, AB is not equal to B times A. Is not equal to B times A in general. So that means they do not commute, which means operating on a state, this is not equal to B times A times A. And such operators are called non-commuting. And you can define what is called as a commutator bracket. A, B minus B. <coughs> so if A and B commute, then the commutator bracket is 0. So in general, for example, you know that uh, position momentum uh, operators do not commute with each other. And it is related to uh, the physical principle that commuting operators, observables which represent commuting operators, can be measured simultaneously accurately. So if two operators commute with each other, it implies that the observables corresponding to these two operators can simultaneously be measured precisely. So if I have an operator A and an operator B and they commute, that means I can measure the observable corresponding to operator A and the observable corresponding to operator B simultaneously, absolutely accurately. So the operating on this op on this gets is actually a, an act of observation. So all it means is that, for example, if you give me a system, I measure the position of a particle first and then the momentum of the particle, I'll get a certain set of results. If you measure the momentum of the particle first and then the position of the particle, the results are different because position and momentum do not commute with each other. But if I have two commuting operators, I can do the measurement in either direction, in either way. I can measure A and B, A first and B second, or B first and A second, and if A and B commute, I'll get the same set of results. So that's the physics behind this commutator and non-commutator operators. Um, and uh, actually, this uh, comes from this, the, the introduction of the commutator bracket, it comes from the Hamiltonian formulation of classical mechanics. Now, I have to introduce what is called as an eigenvalue equation. You are familiar with eigenvalue equations in matrices. So here also, we introduce an eigenvalue equation. So if an operator A, operates on uh, a ket, which I just denote by a n. If it gives me 
the same ket with a number. So there's no, this, this is a number. This operator operating on this ket vector gives me the same ket vector with some number outside. So I'm just using the same, uh, same symbol for the state representing uh, a n ket and the value a n. This is called an eigenvalue equation and this a n are called the eigen kets. And this quantities a n are called the eigenvalues. This is similar to again matrices. If you have a column vector, uh, if you have a square matrix, you can actually calculate the eigenvalues of the matrix by this kind of an equation. And you can show that these eigenvectors are such that when they operate, when you operate on the eigenvector, you get the same eigenvector with an eigenvalue. Now, A could be any operator. If it is an observable, OK, first, A n are the values that you will measure of the observable or of the of the quantity corresponding to the operator a suppose a represents momentum operator then if you are given a state of the system the measurement of the momentum so i will have to calculate what are the momentum uh, uh, what are the equations corresponding to this so i will replace a by the momentum operator and calculate the eigenvalues and eigenvectors so any measurement of momentum of the system will give me one of the eigenvalues. The eigenvalues are the values that I will measure when I measure that quantity on the system. And because all observables are real, A has to be Hermitian operator because Hermitian operators have real eigenvalues. So for a given state, the eigenvalues are the values that I will measure of the observable. Which means if you give me any state of the system, when I do a measurement of the energy of the system, I will find one of the eigenvalues. Now, quantum mechanics has to explain things like interference that takes place. In a Mach zentral interferometer, you can have an interferometer for electrons, and you have interference effects of electrons. You have interference of light. So I would have to introduce the concept that there is an interference. And so there has to be the concept of superposition, linear superposition. So in quantum mechanics, I can have states uh, which are superposition states. Now there's a lot of uh, uh, physics behind the superposition state that if you have a state, if, if the system can be in a state A or in a state B, it can be in a state of a superposition of state A and state B simultaneously. Now, when we go through the analysis, we will see that it creates a, some, some, some kind of a conceptual problem because uh, uh, especially in the beam splitter situation, for example, light can be either reflected or transmitted. So light actually is in a superposition of transmitted and reflected. Classically, this is not possible. You'll see obviously the particle is either here or here. But quantum mechanics allows the particle to be present at two places simultaneously. So for, a, uh, for any observable, so any all observables are represented by Hermitian operators. That is A dagger is equal to A. If A is an observable, if A is an operator corresponding to an observable, A dagger is equal to A. And I will write an equation like this, solve this equation to find out what are the values of an and what are the eigenkets an. I will find that the eigenvalues are all real. And for each eigenvalue, there is an eigenket. Now, this eigenvalues could be a discrete set, which means these are some numbers, some values, but they can be infinite in number. Or I could have a continuous values, range of values. For example, a particle, if it is a position operator, the position can be anyone, anywhere. It's, it's not discretized. But if it corresponds to, for example, uh, as we will discuss in the harmonic oscillator, if it corresponds to energy, it has a discrete spectrum. There are only discrete values, but these are infinite in number. 
that's a separate problem. There are infinite possibilities, but each one, each one of them is a particular value of the energy. It's not a continuous spectrum, it is a discrete spectrum. Now, one can show that, okay, now it is possible in general that there may be more than one state corresponding to the same eigenvalue. So if you, if you look at matrices, there is possibility that the eigenvalues are repeated. If you take a three by three matrix, there'll be three eigenvalues, three eigenvectors. So you may have two of them which are the same, which are equal. So there is a possibility. So in a system in which you have different states correspond to the same eigenvalue, these are called degenerate states. So they're the same eigenvalue. For example, A could correspond to the um, energy operator, all the, also the Hamiltonian operator. If A is an energy operator, then A ends will be the values of energy, possible values of energy. Corresponding A ends will be the corresponding kets. That means the state of the system with that particular energy A n. What it implies, if I prepare a state in a ket A n, or if I can describe my state which I have prepared by a ket A n, it implies that it is in an eigenstate corresponding to an energy eigenvalue A n. And any measurement that I do on the system will give me a value A n. Yes, Moi. Corresponding to the eigenvalue, definite eigenvalue A n, we have a state of the system. Yes. So, but as I said, there may be more than one eigenvalue for which this, I, the, the states are different. The system can be two different states with the same eigenvalue. The ket vector is not a state. Ket vector represents the state. I could have two different value, values of an, two different kets, an and an prime, both of them having the same eigenvalue an. These are called degenerate states. They have the same energy, for example. If for every eigenvalue there is only one corresponding eigenket, then these are non-degenerate states. And we will, as we go through, we will uh, primarily be looking at non-degenerate states. And the different eigenkets are set, set to be orthonormal to each other, orthogonal to each other. So this uh, is delta mn, but delta is uh, the Kronecker delta function. So if m is equal to n, it is 1, otherwise it is 0. So this is the meaning of orthogonality. It means independence. It essentially implies that the state of a system, if, if the system is in a state ket a n, I cannot write it as a superposition of the system state in other eigenkets. That means they are completely independent. For example, modes of oscillation of a string, if you have uh, a mode oscillating in the first, eigen, first excited state, I can't write it as a superposition of the other states of the oscillation of the, of the string. So they're all independent, orthonormal states. They are completely independent states. So, if you have a system in, a, uh, in an eigenket A n, then it is orthonormal to all other eigenkets of the same system. This is, this is uh, in the non-degenerate case, but in degenerate case, actually I can write a linear combination of these states and make it, uh, make it satisfy this condition, but we will not discuss that. And as I told you, we usually choose and that is why when m is equal to 1, n, sorry, m is equal to n, this becomes 1. So this is normalization condition. This is normalized. So if you, if you have an eigenvalue equation like this, The only values that you will ever get of a measurement of the observable corresponding to the operator A are one of the ANs. So if you're given a system, you represent it by a ket, and if you want to find out the eigenvalues corresponding to the, to the energy, so I will have the operator corresponding to energy multiplied by the ket, 
is equal to some number multiplied by the same ket. I solve this equation and get the values of the, eigen, the eigenvalues and the eigenkets. The, it implies that any, val, any measurement of energy, if A represents the energy operator, then any measurement of the energy can only give me one of the values A n that I have calculated from this equation. Yes? So basically, A n is an eigenket. A n ket is an eigenket. Yeah. So the, the general state of the system will be like A, which will be superposition of all the... I'll come to it, yes. But first what I'm saying is, if you are given a system, if you are given a system, any arbitrary system corresponding to this description, and if, if I measure the energy of that system, I will always get one of the eigenvalues. I can't get anything else because that is, these are the only possible values of energy that this system can ever have. Now, this gets form a complete set of functions, a complete set of gets. So any state of the system, any state of the system can be written as a superposition of these eigenkets here. Psi is the general state of the system. ANs are the eigenkets of the operator. So any state of the system, and this is an important superposition principle. This is, I'm assuming, superposition. That means AN satisfy the equation, and Psi also satisfies the, the equations of quantum mechanics. Now, you can actually use this condition to calculate the values of CN by multiplying by uh, AM on the other side, for example. So I can multiply AM, Psi is equal to sigma CN, AM, AN, and this is equal to sigma Cn delta Mn, which is equal to Cm. So the, the expansion coefficients are actually given by this uh, projection. So I can write psi as sigma An psi, sorry, An. So this is Cn. So this can also be written as sigma a n a n psi. So this actually this is the sigma. The sigma is over n. This must be identity because psi is equal to something to psi. So this must be so this implies sigma n a n a n is equal to one. This is Please remember, this is an operator. This, this uh, left, left product, ket multiplied by bra is an operator. This is not equal to bra multiplied by ket. With these two different, that's an operator because you can operate with this on a ket and you get another ket. This is called the closure property. And this means essentially that these kets form a complete set of eigenfunctions or eigenkets. And any ket, any state of the system can be written as a superposition of these eigenkets. Okay, so, so this is some kind of a vector uh, a picture in terms of uh, ket vectors, etc. So in quantum mechanics, what quantum mechanics says is, first thing is that the state of any system will be represented by a ket. And that ket contains all the information that you can ever have about the system. Now that is not sufficient for me. I must, for example, I need to know what, if I, if I, if I give you a certain state with a certain ket, what, what will I get if I measure the energy of the, of, the, of the system? So I define the expectation value. Now, so you see, what is happening is that although get ANs are eigen catch of the system, which means that if I had a system prepared in a state of A and ket, if I measure the, for example, suppose A and ket corresponds to the uh, 
to this eigenvalue and A happens to be the energy operator or the Hamiltonian operator, then it means that if my state is prepared in a state A and ket, when I measure the energy, I will get the eigenvalue, I get, I'll get the value An as the energy. So every time I measure, so in, in quantum mechanics, because the act of measurement itself disturbs the system, what I need to do is I need to prepare a large number of identical systems and I measure the energy of this, energy of this, energy of this, energy of this. Because if I measure the energy of this, I already disturb the system. So I can't measure the energy again of that system to get a proper value. So what I do is I prepare an ensemble of systems, a large number of identical systems, measure the energy here, energy here, energy here, energy here, and then I may get the same value or I may get different values. If all the measurements will give me the same value, that means my system is prepared in one of the eigenkets corresponding to that operator. If all my ensemble system, if I measure the energy here, energy here, energy here, I get the same value E1 in all cases. That means the state which I have prepared is in one of the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian operator and that is why I'm getting the same energy value every time. But if I have a system prepared in a superposition state like this, each measurement may give me a different value, will give me a different value. What will happen is the act of measurement makes the quantum system jump into one of the eigenstates of the system. And if it jumps to the ket an, I'll get an. If it jumps to an, uh, an eigenstate am, I'll get am. If it jumps to a0, I'll get a0, eigenvalue, etc. So there is a finite probability of measure, measuring each value of energy in the entire ensemble. So each measurement may give me a different value. So I define what is called as expectation value. And so I will define expectation value as, for example, if I an operator H, this is the expectation value, which means that this is the value of the quantity, average value of the quantity corresponding to the operator H that I will obtain on measurement of the systems. So that's postulate. So I, I say that if you have, if you have an observable, and H represents the corresponding operator of that observable. If you prepare a state of the system in a ket psi, then this is the average value of the quantity corresponding to that observable. So if H represents energy operator, Hamiltonian operator, then this is the average value of energy that I will measure among the ensemble of states. So I measure the energy of each state, and then I take an average, and I will get this expectation value. So let me, for example, uh, use this, uh, this equation to, uh, to simplify. So let me assume that psi is generated in a state which is, uh, let me call this now, uh, now let me write, uh, because I'm looking at energy instead of just A, let me write En. So En is the, get En, is the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian operator or the energy operator with an eigenvalue En. Ket En represents the state of a system, one of the eigenkets corresponding to an eigenvalue En. And because the state of the system can be written as a superposition of these states, this is Cn times En. So what happens to this so H? Okay. So this, because ENs are the eigenkets, this also implies that, sorry, H into EN is equal to EN, EN. If H is the Hamiltonian operator or the energy operator, then H EN is EN times EN. So I will, if I calculate this quantity, psi H psi. Now please note from here, psi is equal to sigma c n star e n. Okay, so let me let me calculate this quantity uh, psi h psi. This is equal to uh, sigma n c n star 
E N H Sigma M C M E M. The summation uh, indices are different. This is psi bra, which is from here, h vector, h h ket, but h operator here, and then psi ket, which is cm em. So this is equal to cn star. Cns are uh, are just numbers, so I just uh, take it out here. I get en h em which is equal to cn star cm en. Now h operating on em simply gives me the eigenvalue em, em. And because this is the number, sorry, there are two sums here, double summation, n and m. cn star cm em en em. And what is this? This is delta mn. So this is equal to, so if I use the uh, Kronecker delta with this double sum, it's related to a single sum and I get em, do mod. That's delta mn and one of the sums goes off with m replaced by n and I get em mod cn square. So this implies, because this is expectation value of energy, so please note that the only values of energy that I can get on measurements are the values EMs, E0, E1, E2, E3, et cetera. And because this is an average, mod Cn square must be the probability of finding the particle in the state corresponding to EM, EN, which this is equal to, what is Cn? Can you tell me what is Cn from this equation? Weightage of, uh, weightage given to... Yeah, but weightage, give me a mathematical symbol for Cn. Uh, okay. That is En psi. En psi. So this is mod... So this is the probability of finding the system in the state corresponding to energy En. So the system can be in a state where it is in a, in a multiple state of various energy simultaneously. Okay, because classically this is not, this is not possible. The system has some energy. What is the energy of the system? I can only calculate an average energy. The energy is, the state, when the system is in the state psi, given by this equation, it is in a superposition state of various energy levels. And that's a very strong statement in quantum mechanics because you allow you see, in waves, there is no problem. You can have a wave in which uh, you can have a string oscillating in the fundamental and the first accelerator mode simultaneously. But for particles, for systems like that, the particle must have some energy, some definite energy. But this one says that the, the system is in a superposition of different energy values. Whenever you measure the energy of that system, you will get one of the eigenvalues. The probability of getting En as, an, as the measured value is given by En bracket En psi mod square. And because the, the probability of finding energy, any energy value, any one of the energy values is 1, mod Cn square must be sum over, it must be equal to 1. Okay, so that's essentially the normalization condition again. Sir. Yeah. No, for example, um, the point is whenever you measure the energy, you will find it one of the energy eigenvalues. But to be able to explain interference effects, you have to have system in superposition states. 
For example, the, in, in yesterday's class, when I told about the Mach Zender interferometer, the, the light seems to be, if, if, I, if I quantize light and talk all in terms of photons, it seems to be, or if I, if I can build a similar interferometer for electrons, for example, the electron seems to be in both paths simultaneously. They have built, they have built a double slit interference pattern for uh, huge atoms like C60. Now this is a, you can't imagine C60 as a, a, a wave, right? It contains 60 carbon atoms. It's a huge molecule. People have performed interference experiments, double slit interference experiments with C60. And you see interference. So it's, it looks as if the C60 particle or C60 object is simultaneously passing through both slits. If I can use this uh, terminology. The problem is we, we, we imagine in terms of particles and then we are trying to understand what is happening. So these are quantum objects. So interference effects cannot be explained if you don't have superposition. Or diffraction effects, they're all, they're all coming from superposition effects. And so, so please remember, I have prepared all these states in an identical st state. All the ensemble, I have say a million such identical states, all identical. But each measurement gives me a different eigenvalue. Each, each measurement gives me a different value of energy. It's like the dream filter experiment. I send photon after photon. I am sending identical photons. The system, I have not changed anything, but sometimes the photon is picked up here by a detector, sometimes it is picked up by a detector here. There are two possibilities. Either the photon goes in this arm or photon goes in this arm. Actually, the photon is going in both arms. But your act of measurement, you are trying to detect, it will appear here or here. So these are the eigenstates. Yes, of the output. And so, the fact that you are, uh, the system is in a superposition state, oh, this is, this is, after all, quantum mechanics today explained, explains all absorbed phenomena. Is it right or wrong? I don't know. You come with a theory which explains all absorbed phenomena, which is not the same as quantum mechanics, your theory is as good until somebody finds out that one of them does not explain something or one of them predicts something and that is not verified experimentally. You see, so when I say uh, there is an uncertainty in measurement of position or momentum of a particle, does the particle have a position and momentum or not? Is it that I am unable to measure it precisely or is it that I cannot even define a position and momentum for the particle? There's nothing like position and momentum. You measure, you get a position value. You measure, you get a momentum value. The, observa the observer, the, the, the act of observation creates a value for position and a value for momentum. Before measurement, is there a position or is there a momentum? Okay, so we will continue in the next class. What I will do is I will briefly review uh, the harmonic oscillator problem, which you must have discussed earlier. But because I will show you that uh, the electromagnetic wave can be written, can be considered as a superposition of an infinite number of harmonic oscillators. So harmonic oscillator plays a very, very important role in the quantization of light. And uh, the photon that, I will, that we will actually discuss are all uh, states of harmonic oscillator, but uh, with respect to uh, the electromagnetic field and not with respect to a particle which is vibrating. Okay, we'll stop here. Any questions? So I would uh, urge you to go back and uh, sort of revise the quantum mechanics because uh, uh, maybe there may be some things which we will use later on, which I may, I may not be covering right now. But as we go through at those stages, wherever we get uh, some different concepts, we will have to use them. Okay, thank you.